Some people say that if Volleyball and Foursquare had a baby, the baby would be called Spikeball. Spikeball is quickly becoming the next American sport. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with the CEO of Spikeball, Chris Reuter, for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Chris Reuter, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I know that you are the CEO of Spikeball. You are a father, a husband, a third place spelling bee trophy winner, and obviously you are forever chasing progress. <laughs> and of course, you're a bootstrap, as you said on Twitter. Let me ask you this, Chris. How are you chasing progress now with Spikeball? Um, good question. I, I like to always be getting better. So I think I phrased it in my Twitter profile as always chasing progress. And, um, I find myself, whether it's in business or in my personal life, happier when it is uh, when I'm trying to improve. So with Spikeball, that is trying to get more people playing all over the world, trying to make sure our products are better, stronger, more fun. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying, trying to build a global community overall. How do you build that global community right now? Um, one way we do it is through tournaments. So we host tournaments all over the U.S., but tournaments are being hosted all over the world. So while we may not be hosting many outside of the U.S., we're actively helping people that are. So there's active groups in Europe, in South America, Australia, uh, Philippines, um, Africa. Um, so whenever we hear people that are playing overseas or really anywhere, We'll try to reach out and ask them, how can we help them? Do they need more sets for their event? Do they have questions on how to play? Um, we want to basically help them become the leader of their community in their, in their hometowns. How are you being a leader in Chicago? Um, well, I lived in Chicago for about the last 18 years, but just moved to uh, Charleston a few months ago. Right. Um, but in Chicago, yeah, so helped with a lot of events there. Um, uh, I think the brand became pretty well known in Chicago. You know, that's where we started. That's um, where we were headquartered. Um, did a decent amount of work with different nonprofits and, you know, trying to help where I can. So um, had a great run in Chicago, but was, was ready for something new. So came down here. Came down to Charleston. Oh, man. And I love Chicago. A lot of people know, and I've talked about it a lot over the past 20 years. Well, I guess it's almost 20 years ago that I ran the Chicago Marathon in 2002. So that city's always in my heart. So nice. yes, sir. Absolutely. And, and speaking of which from 2008 to right now, Chris, what is the biggest difference about spike ball? Uh, in 2008, I could probably count all of the players on my two hands and we now have millions playing. Ooh. Um, so we did not have any formal tournaments back then. You couldn't buy it at any stores. You could mm -hmm. only buy it on spikeball.com, but now you can get it at Target, Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, here in Charleston, you can get it at Wonderworks, at Half Moon Outfitters. Um, and yeah, there's, there's millions of people playing all over the world. So it's been really gratifying to see not only how many people are playing, but, you know, if you go to any of our, of our events or if you happen to see somebody playing at a park and you walk up and ask them some questions about it, um, I, I, of course, am biased, but I think our community are some of the nicest people out there. They're very welcoming um, and wanting to get more and more people playing. So that's been a nice element of it all. How many more players do you want to have playing spike ball in 2022? Um, we don't necessarily have a number for how many more, but we just want to make sure that we're always growing. So, um, and it's also very difficult to put a number on how many players there actually are. You know, there's millions of people to, that, that have played all over the world, but, you know, there's this many people that have, um, you know, gone to our tournament. So a lot of people consider it a fun backyard game. That's great. Other people start with it there, but then they realize, oh, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I want to compete against others. And they'll, you know, download the Spikeball app and maybe look for a tournament or some pickup games in their area. So um, trying to get more and more people playing. One thing that's really helped build our uh, exposure, a lot of our tournaments are showing up on ESPN too. Wow. Um, so, you know, we are trying to create a legitimate sport. Um, and that has helped out with legitimizing what we're doing a lot. Oh, man, that's, that, that is so amazing. So you moved from Chicago to Charleston. Why Charleston? Why now? 
Uh, I've got some family here, so I've been visiting over the years and liked it a lot. Um, especially liked it in the wintertime uh, as compared to Chicago. Um, but, you know, I, I was telling a friend the other day, you know, I sort of liken it to, you know, your favorite song. So you listen to the favorite song for a while. You love it. You love it. But eventually you're, you're looking for something different, maybe a new song. doesn't mean you don't like the old song. Right. Um, you know, I was uh, raised, born and raised in the Chicago area and been there most of my life. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I was kind of just getting the scratch the last three to five years for something new. And during COVID last year, you know, my kids were doing remote school. So we got to come, we came down here and did some Airbnbs for about six weeks and, uh, really fell in love with the area. So, uh, came down a few months ago and really liking it so far. How does Charleston meet Spike Ball? How does Charleston meet Spike Ball? So I guess one thing, one of our first ever events, I think this might have been in 2009, uh, we actually hosted in Charleston at uh, Folly Beach. Yes. Um, and that was when nobody had ever heard of it. We, I think I had one friend here. Uh, she ran a company or helped run a company called, uh, I think it was Waboba. And it was like basically this ball that like you skip on water. They're still around doing really well. It's a pretty cool wow. product. And we co-hosted an event at Folly Beach, and we, you know, it's going to be a spike ball tournament and this Waboba thing. And um, I knew nobody down here. Uh, she knew some people, but I think we actually had more people working the event that actually attended it. Um, so not not our biggest success, but um, you know, Charleston was very early on and uh, having a presence in our community. And um, there's a lot of kids playing at College of Charleston. A uh, lot of students playing at USC, uh, Clemson. We hosted our college national championship at Clemson a couple of years ago. Wow. Um, so a lot of, lot of local players, which we really like. Oh, that, 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 that is just amazing. How do you educate Charlestonians about spike ball in 2021? Um, trying to get people playing more often. Um, and we do a lot on social media. So, you know, our... Uh, just Google spike ball and you'll find us on all platforms. Um, PE teachers and at schools have been very important to us as well. So we've got a few people that their sole job is to reach out to educators and make uh, our products a part of their program. So I'll uh, hopefully be doing some outreach at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll get out playing more often and meeting people in parks and uh, continuing to spread the word. What was the outreach in Chicago? About spike ball. Yeah, so in the early days, in 2008, 2009, um, I hosted leagues. So it was every Thursday night down at North Avenue Beach uh, yes. in Chicago. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd have 20, 30 people playing. And great thing about playing there, uh, right at North Avenue Beach, uh, there's uh, a bike path that goes by. And thousands of people go by. and It's a great place to get uh, lots of exposure. So that was one. Um, we hosted a lot of tournaments, a lot of different events. We'd go to uh, community events that were already happening and kind of tag along with their, uh, what they had set up. Um, another group that we worked a lot with and we still do is Ultimate Frisbee. Um, mm -hmm. For some reason, we've noticed that a lot of Ultimate players really like spike ball as well. So uh, we show up to a lot of their tournaments, either give away free sets or invite people to play. And um, Yeah, it's worked out pretty well. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Let me ask you this, Chris. Did you even have a clue about the sport, say, in 2003? Um, I knew of it. So I originally discovered spike ball uh, around 1989, 1990 or so. So um, it was around for about two years, but the original company gave up on it and essentially abandoned it. Um, and that was when I was like 14 years old. And some friends and I played on and off over the years. And then in 2003, we played again, and that's when I really got the bug for it. Uh, 2004, sorry. Um, and then uh, that's when we first started talking. Right. Back to life. So, wow. Um, yeah. Wow. What was that sport, sport that is that you actually idolized before Spike Bowl? Um, oddly enough, I was not that into sports. Um, so, this is a Decent, not great athlete in high school. You know, I played tennis for four years. Um, I played football for three weeks my freshman year in high school. Um, 
So I tried different things, but wasn't really that great at them. Um, and the thing I've loved most about Spikeball is watching, you know, building the business. Uh, I absolutely love that. You know, I just devour business books and read almost all nonfiction. And um, I've really enjoyed building the community and learning how to build the community. So, you know, if we were just building the net and selling the rubber ball and that was it, that'd be one thing. But all the people I've met over the years, you know, we've met people that have spike ball tattoos on their body and we've met people that met their spouses through playing and um, there's been some really nice stories. So that's the stuff that uh, uh, really means a lot. What story still plays in your mind? Um, gosh, there's a lot of stories that play in my mind. Um, but I guess, uh, let's see, if I had to pick one. Um, I went to one of our employees' weddings a few weeks ago, um, and he's been with us for years, been a fantastic employee, um, and had Spikeball not existed, there's a pretty good chance he never would have met his spouse. So as I was sitting there in the audience and different people got up to give speeches, uh, nearly every single person mentioned the word Spikeball. Uh, they all loved it. Um, and knowing that I had just a teeny tiny part in the two of them meeting each other and this relationship developing uh, all the way to marriage, uh, that felt really nice. Um, so that was a recent one that I really enjoyed. Yeah, I'm sure the profits went up 20% after that wedding. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you, you, talk, you talked earlier about obviously business plan and obviously building a community. How did your business plan match this new sport? Um, we never really actually had a business plan. Um, you know, I don't, I have a degree in photojournalism, so I never really studied business or marketing or anything like that. Um, when we decided we're going to start the business, I remember Googling, I think I looked up like how to write a business plan or something like that. And I found a, a template and I deleted all the previous company's information. And I think it was like a 19 page document. And I started filling it out and I think I got to page three and then I had other things to do. So I had to, you know, I had to, you know, customer service tickets to respond to or different things and um, never got back to actually completing it. And I'm much more of a doer than I am a planner. Sometimes that works well for me, other times not. Um, but I can tell you like I, back in 2008, when we launched the last thing, that I thought would be possible would be millions of people playing all over the world or us hosting tournaments or us being on ESPN or on Shark Tank or, you know, this whole thing has grown to be a thousand times bigger than, than I ever thought possible. So um, I am grateful for that. Wow, that's just amazing. When did you start accepting teams? Um, we, I had that after work event, uh, or sort of uh, league, uh, in 08 and 09, I think it might have gone into 2010. I think our first tournament, 2012, maybe something like that. It was in Chicago at, um, what was it, North Street Beach, um, Oak Street Beach. Ooh. Um, and you know, we call it a tournament, but it was essentially 20 of us. One guy had a clipboard and a pencil and drop a bracket and, Shortly after that, we had a bigger one in Manhattan Beach, uh, in California, and uh, a lot of it was following what the players and the communities wanted. So, you know, and we also saw a lot of friendly trash talk on um, Twitter and social media of, you know, one guy from New York would be, you know, say they're the best, and then a guy from California would reply, and a girl from Washington would say, no, I'm better. Um, <laughs> So we translated that as, okay, you know, these players want to compete. They want to play against others. So we created the Spikeball app so you can find people um, uh, geographically and schedule pickup games or play tournaments against them. We created a national ranking system as well. So, you know, we know who the best players are. You know, a month or so ago, we had our national championships in Philadelphia. Yes. We had almost a thousand players competing there. Um, and we crowned national champs, and um, yeah, it was it was awesome. Next year, we're going to be scheduling our, or we're going to be hosting our first ever world championship. Yes. Uh, that will hopefully be in Belgium, I believe, in sometime in September. And we're hoping to have over thirty countries registered there. Um, yeah. So it should be great. Oh, absolutely! That 
to my next cast question, Chris. Chris, that is, how do you all actually keep score? Um, so it's a uh, rally score. So um, there's a uh, if you cannot get the ball back on the net, the other team gets a point. Um, so the rules to the sport are nearly identical to vo- like two on two volleyball. So two on two volleyball, you know, you and your partner get your bump, set, and spike. You get your three hits, uh, and then you have to b- hit the ball over the net. Um, with our sport, you still get your three hits, but you don't hit the ball over a net. You spike it down onto the net, and you want to spike it in such a way that your opponent can't get it. Right. Uh, unlike volleyball, there are no sides. You know, like with volleyball, you stand on one side of the net, and your opponents are on the other. Um, with uh, our sport. Um, it's a round net, and there's literally no boundaries. You can run all around it any, any way. So, um, yeah. If you Google how to play spike ball or how to play round net, uh, that's, that, that makes it a lot clearer than listening to it in words. No, no I got it perfectly there. But, <laughs> <I got it. laughs> but uh, let me ask you this. Where is spike ball ranked nationally? Um, that's a good question. I've never seen a ranking of sports. Um, you know, I guess if you have to rank the big ones, obviously, basketball, baseball, football um, are, are up there. Um, I'd say we're way down the list. We are still absolutely tiny, but we're seeing tremendous growth. Um, you know, I do like to uh, sort of, you know, pickleball right now, right? They are absolutely exploding. Yes. Um, so I'm doing what I can to learn from that sport. Um Ultimate Frisbee is going pretty well. Lacrosse is going pretty well. Um, all of those sports, though, are 20, 30 years older than us. You know, pickleball is blowing up right now, but I think it was created back in the 60s or 70s. Um, and, you know, if you look at basketball or any of the very established sports, those are well over 100 years. Um, so we're still pretty darn young, but growing really fast and uh, hoping to, to be amongst their ranks someday. Oh yes, indeed, absolutely. And, and speaking of which, you said, "Hey, your guys, are, you guys are relatively young." But what is your budget today? Uh, we don't disclose any of our finances, um, but we are spending a lot of money to develop the sport, to develop the products, uh, to build the community. Um, and you know, it was interesting. Like with um, you know, when COVID hit last year. We, like all businesses, thought, you know, the end of the world is here and it's going to be, um, you know, really tough, uh, tough rowing. But uh, outdoor recreation, most of us actually saw our business grow quite significantly. Now, we got to grow, but we couldn't host events, you know, due to social distancing and trying to be safe. So now that, um, you know, fingers crossed that, you know, COVID gets behind us or much, much uh less um we can we started hosting our events again we're, we're doing it in as safe a fashion as possible um and you know i was talking to my team the other day and they were asking me sort of what am i excited about next year and i again with fingers crossed i said i'd love to have a full 12 months of tournaments yes. you know this year we only got to do about half the year wow wow that's that last year we had done. Yeah. um so yeah okay I know you can't disclose your budget today, but what was your budget when you started in 2008? Um, our annual revenue at the end of 2008, I think it was about $11,000. Wow. Um, I didn't know if that was good or bad because I had you know, nothing to compare it to. Um, but you know, when I started the company, I, I never thought that it'd be big enough to where I could quit my day job and go full time. Right. So... You know, I started it in 2008, but ran it for five years as a night job. Mm. And then it wasn't until 2013. Uh, in 2013, we had a million dollars in annual revenue with zero full-time employees. Mm. And at that time, my wife and I agreed it was okay for me to quit my day job and go full-time at Spike Ball. Um, we've been hiring people ever since. We've got, I think, 41 full-timers now. Um, We've been a remote company for years, so um, you know our employees live all over the U.S. We've got one in Canada and two in the U.K. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, um, a lot of companies were forced to go remote due to COVID, 
we were already doing it. So we didn't see much of a shift there, but you know, we do do um, company retreats twice a year. So we can all get together and see each other. And we just did one a few weeks ago down in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So just a couple hours south of here. And it was really nice. I actually got to meet a bunch of employees I had never met face to face. You know, we've been hiring a bunch during COVID and it's all been Zoom interviews and that sort of thing. So uh, really nice to get that uh, face to face contact. Absolutely. And I love the Golden Isles, which they call it down there, Jekyll Island, Sea Island, and all of that. But let me ask you, uh, where is the ship as far as spike ball right now as you see it? Um, I think one shift we've got is most people that have played still consider it a fun backyard game. Um, we are trying to create the next great global sport. Um, so how do those two jive? And what we don't want to do is turn off the backyard player and try and force everybody to become a competitive player. You know, there's tons of families that like, you know, they like bringing it on when they go camping or playing in the backyard or just casual fun. And we'd love to get as many of those type of players coming to our tournaments and, you know, treating it as a legitimate sport, but not everybody wants that. And that's fine. Um, one way we are kind of, uh, bridging that is a lot of, uh, high school students discover it maybe in gym class and they have fun with it. Um, we're noticing when they get to college though, maybe they're not good enough or maybe they never found a sport where they could compete at that, you know, NCAA collegiate level, right. but there is a spike ball club there or there is a round net club. Um, so we're seeing, you know, I think I, I saw a tweet recently, um, in September, when all the students were coming back on campus, I think Ohio State had something like 800 kids sign up for their spike ball club. Uh, I was absolutely shocked. Um, so seeing those kind of numbers um, is, you know, that's going, if we can keep doing that and just pouring gas on that fire, um, the, the sport's going to get much, much bigger. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I hate to ask this, Chris. Who is your closest competitor? Good question. There's a lot of companies making what we consider knockoff sets, but none of them are um, focused on building a brand or a community. So we really wouldn't consider them a competitor. I'd say from a sport perspective, I'd say probably pickleball is the closest one. Um, you know, stereotype of pickleball is... It's an older person, maybe a retiree place or retiree playing. And I think that's what it's historically been, but their average age is dropping very fast. They're getting a lot of young people in their 20s and 30s playing. Um, that's exactly who we want playing our sport. Um, with that said, we've got a lot of friends that are running pickleball tournaments and we're, it's not like we're going head to head. Uh, we're working together to try and help grow each other. So it's been a, it's been a good relationship with pickleball folks. Absolutely. What is your average demographic? Um, again, very difficult to measure because, you know, when we sell a set at Dick's Sporting Goods or Walmart or Target, yeah. they don't tell us who actually bought it. We just know that somebody bought it. Um, but through looking at our and our common surveys we do, I'd say the typical... I haven't looked at it in a while. I'd say probably a 25 year old guy. Um, we are doing a lot of work trying to get more women playing, more people of color playing. A lot of people call us sort of this bro sport, uh, which currently is somewhat accurate, but we are working hard to kind of get people that, you know, don't look like me to get to play more. I want our sport to be very inclusive and get everybody playing. So trying to come up with plans on how we can uh, get everybody playing. What is your plan for minorities? Um, we are, we just identified four priorities for uh, 2022. We've identified them. We have not yet built the plan on how we're going to go after them. One of them is getting more people of color, especially black people playing. Um, we've noticed that of all groups, that's one that is the most uh, least represented in our overall community. And that's not only just for our community, that is in our marketing, that is in our employee base, that's in our supply chain. Um, I actually just finished a fantastic book uh, called Dear White Friend by oh, Mel Gravely. I saw him present a few months ago, and 
Number one, it's an awesome book. So if you haven't read it, everybody pick it up. Um, and he's got some great steps in there on um, what can be done. And I think a lot of people, at least in my position, when you know they start thinking about diversity or equity or getting more more people playing, they sort of look outside of their circle of influence. Um, and he's proposing look within. So my circle of influence, the, the one that I have the most uh, influence over, is my company. So what can I do with my company? You know, I think a lot of people go write a check or donate or volunteer somewhere outside of their circle of influence. So what can I do within my circle? So I'm going to be sitting down with my team and we've been talking about it a lot, but don't have the formal plan yet. Um, but it's going to be a big push in 2022. One thing we have been doing all this year um, is making sure we have more people of color and more women in a lot of our marketing you know, if you looked at most of our Instagram posts, um, I'd say maybe two years ago and earlier, it was nearly almost all white people. Um, this year, we've gotten a lot better. We still got a lot of work to do, but we're seeing some good uh, progress. We're taking some baby steps and looking forward to doing a lot more in uh, in 22. But looking forward to getting that, getting a formal plan put down. So we've never had that, and I think that's why we have uh, uh, haven't made as much progress as I'd like. What position is your company in right now when, when it comes to supply chain issues here in the States? Um, we had a lot of delays this summer. Uh, you know, so you know, we, we do manufacture in China and it all comes into West Coast ports. Um, and we had, not only do we have delays, but the, uh, the, the price of getting a 40 foot steel shipping container from China to our warehouse outside of, outside of Chicago, the price was insane. So before COVID, I think we paid maybe $7,000 in shipping fees to get that container from China to Chicago. Um, this summer, we were paying $28,000 for that exact same container. Uh, so our margins have just taken an absolute beating. Now that has come down a bit. Um, but really difficult to try and invest more in growing the sport when your costs on freight have just gone through the roof. Um, now, fingers crossed, my operations team tells me we're looking good for inventory for holiday season. You know, obviously, we're well underway. Right. <laughs> um, and they tell me we'll be good for inventory. Um, but, you know, with Chinese New Year coming up, I think it's end of January. Um, uh, you know, pretty much everything shuts down for like a week then. And then we'll see how things get going after that. But um, it was terrible this summer, but I'd say it's getting a little bit better right now is my loose way to, to describe it. Now, when you look at your, 22, well, your 2022 budget and those margins, what do you be looking at? What will you look at? Um, the way I've described it to my team was 2020. So when COVID hit, you know, our sales went through the roof. And that created an insane amount of stress, but our top line and bottom line did pretty well. And then 2021, which we're in right now, um, you know, if we look at 2020 as this, you know, uh, uh, for purely looking at, right. at the business side of things, it was like this crazy spike ball. Everything was up and to the right. Uh, I look at 2021 as the hangover from that party. So we grew way faster than we were prepared to. We made it through, but tons of stress, a lot of, uh, you know, employees just overworked and, um, you know, the, the machine we had built was not ready for that kind of growth. And now, you know, the, the machine was this big. Now it's this big for us. And this year we have spent trying to rebuild systems. Maybe do, we did some reorganization of, you know, different people reporting to different people and, um, while still hiring a bunch. So I feel like we're in a much better position there, um, but our profits took an absolute beating this year. So last year was the party, this year was the hangover, and I'm hoping next year is going to be when we get back to focusing on our bottom line. Um, you know, that is, you know, without the bottom line, uh, you know, top line doesn't really matter. So um, getting back to a focus on that and getting to a more of a steady, stable growth uh, is what I'm hoping for in 2022. How is this machine ready for 2023, 2024, 
Um, we try to, we, we do have a five-year strategic plan. Um, we've had that for a couple of years. It uh, goes through the end of 2023. Um, and we do look at that about once a year and make small modifications. Um, but, you know, I you know got a note from my head of finance the other day. He's got budgets laid out through, I think, mid-2023. Um, and, you know, this a lot of people build companies with the sole goal of selling them. Um, I have no intention of selling. I hope to be running and owning the business for a very long time. And if that's the goal, you, you're for, you have to take a long-term perspective. You know, I don't want to take any, make any uh, short-term decisions that'll hurt, hurt us in the long term. Um, so we, we do a decent amount of long-term planning, but you know, whether you call it a plan or a forecast, um, you know, forecast at least, you know, I consider a forecast a fancy word for a guess. Um, you're essentially guessing what's going to happen. So we do have long-term plans, but I don't want to remain so focused to them that that's the only reason we're waking up every day. You know, we need to do our, our sit-ups and push-ups every day. And as long as we focus on that, we're going to get somewhere pretty incredible in a couple of years. But it's focusing on that day-to-day -day stuff that will allow us to get to those long-term goals. And how many employees have you hired since 2020? Um, I think we've hired, I don't know the exact number, but I'd say probably 10 to 12. Wow. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, um, we've nearly doubled. Actually, it's more than that. So I think we had just under, in 2019, I think we were right around 20 people, 25. So we've nearly doubled in our uh, headcount in about uh, two, two and a half years. Wow. And, you know, you talked about obviously long-term planning and you have some uh, life tips on your website that I just saw. You said this, have fun. Let me ask you, what is fun about Spike Bowl? Um, it's four people and there's no boundaries. So the proximity that you're going to have with your opponent um, is, I think, much closer than, than a lot of sports. Another thing we've noticed is it's such a unique sport that um, people are drawn to it, right? If you play in the park, there, it's almost guaranteed somebody's going to walk up to you and say, "Hey, what's that game?" And you know, the if, you know, if I'm talking to a friend that you know has no idea what spike ball is, or let's say I just met somebody and oh, what do you do for work? I'm like, oh, I work at this company, Spike Ball. They maybe haven't heard of the name, but they definitely know of that weird trampoline game that you see in the park. Yeah. Uh, that's what people describe it as if they haven't seen it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah. So, and I think that since it's so unique, you know, think of any other sport where you use your hand to hit a ball on a net. Um, you know, and uh, the, the name of the sport actually, a lot of people think the name of the sport is spike ball. The name of the sport is round net. Mm. Um, you know, the, the net is literally round. round. <laughs> uh, I can't think of any other sport that has a round net in it. Um, so yeah, that, that's amazing. Oh, let me ask you this. And I, I thought about this just uh, a few minutes ago, but are, what is that ideal athletic stance for spike ball? Um, well, when, if you're receiving the serve, you're kind of right. Bend down a bit, hands are up like this. I don't know if this person's going to come back here or here. Right. Um, but yeah, staying low and on your toes and ready to react. And, um, you know, if we were talking to some of our top players, they may give a little different answer. But, um, you know, uh, I used to be one of the top players back when there were only like 10 players in the world. Yeah. Um, but my, uh, my ranking has dropped significantly over the years as more <laughs> people much younger than I have been started playing. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. But then let me ask you, what is that power stance? Um, well, I mean, if you're serving, there's, um, you know, a serve. So I actually got a ball right here. So a serve is you throw it up with one hand and literally hit it with the other. Um, and some will throw it up and just go straight like this. You can't see my legs, but you'd have one foot pivoted. But you can go back and forth like this. Others may do like a behind the back. There's a fuengo serve, a cut serve. Um, you know, there's people putting up tutorial videos on all this stuff. Um, you know, there's a, a, a YouTube page start, uh, a YouTube uh, page titled "How to Round Net," um, and there's all sorts of um, 
great tutorials there. Um, Preston Bias runs it. You know, he's one of the top players out there and a great coach. So, um, yeah, yeah. Some people are hosting camps and stuff, teaching younger players how to play. And, yeah, it's been cool to see. Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. And you said this, trust. Give it until you shouldn't. What are you trusting in this sports? Um, that's one of our values. And I, that um, we defined as, you know, in general, I, I think life is a lot more fun when you're, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more pleasant, more enjoyable. If when you meet somebody, you, you trust them at that moment and you don't make them earn it on day one. Um, so I am a very trustworthy person and, you know, with most of our games and most of our tournaments, there's no referee. Uh, so it is the two teams are calling on each other. Um, so they need to trust each other that they are making the right calls. Now at our bigger tournaments in the semis and championship rounds, um, there are observers, and if there is a disagreement, you can ask the observer to make the final call. Um, but, you know, that, that value in life in general, I think, you know, uh, yeah, just trust people. I think 99% of people out there are good. They're well-intended. Um, of course, there are some knuckleheads out there that are, that are going to try to burn you, but um, I think those are pretty rare. And you said this too, go big. Failure is part of success. What part of your business failure has allowed you to go big and be successful? Let's go back to 2003 and four when you're really trying to make it. Yeah, so um, one time when I didn't go big, it was right when we got started, we filed for the trademark to protect the name Spikeball. And I think that cost us like $800 or something. So not that bad. Um, I had the option to, um, I forget what it's called. I think it's called like the Madrid protocol or something like that. That gives you first right of refusal, uh, to have the trademark in like 20 or 30 countries, including most European countries that would have cost a couple thousand dollars extra. Um, I did not do that, you know, cause I, we hadn't even started the company. I was like, wait, spike ball is not even a thing in the U S why would I think it'd become big elsewhere? So I didn't do it. We launched, uh, had a big party down on North Avenue Beach to launch. And then a few weeks later, I got a note from a guy saying, uh, hey, I live in Germany and I saw you guys uh, at uh, North Avenue Beach. I was in, in Chicago and I'd like to be the guy that launches uh, Spikeball in Europe. And I replied to him saying, hey, thanks. Uh, we're actually just getting started. Not quite ready to go into Europe, but you know, let's keep in touch. Uh, a few months later, he replied, hey, I just applied and got the trademark for Spikeball for all of Europe and China. Um, let's talk. I was, of course, livid. And I said, I'm happy to talk, but you need to transfer those trademarks to me. And um, I'll pay you for them, whatever your legal fees were. But um, anyway, long story short, that wound up being a very expensive lawsuit for us. Uh, we lost it. Uh, the law is whoever files first gets it. He filed before us. Um, we eventually had to buy him out, and that cost us an ungodly amount of money. So I did not go big. I failed, but it wound up being a part of my success. So what did I do after that? We started filing for trademarks in nearly every country on planet Earth. Um, we've spent a lot of money on trademarks, but we are very well protected. We now have the trademarks in Europe and China and dozens of other countries. And uh, yeah, lesson learned. Wow. Oh, my. You also said this, listen, improve, always be learning. What things are you listening to that you need to improve on when it comes to spike ball? Um, I think listening just in general. Um, a lot of us listen to respond. And... I want us to listen to understand, to listen to learn. So, um, you know, what's the line goes? We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I love that. Like anytime I, you know, nobody at Spikeball has ever gotten fired for making a mistake. Um, we're human. That, all, that always happens. Um, now, if you make the same, make, same mistake over and over, 
okay, that means you're probably not listening and you're not improving. So that, that's an issue. Let's talk about that. Um, but yeah, that's a big one. And it's, you know, one time, you know, it's a value of ours. And um, anytime I hear that somebody in our team, you know, maybe they used to do something this way, but they learned a better way and they're now doing it that way. I love to highlight, hey, yeah, that's a good job of listen, improve, always be learning. And they didn't learn because I told them to learn or because the boss kind of wagged a finger at them. It's because they have that self-intrinsic, that, that motivation um, of wanting to learn. And those are the type of people that we like to hire and that I, I just like to work with. How do you keep motivating yourself to continue to allow, to allow spike ball, that is, to grow? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't like find myself having to like pump myself up or to try to get excited. Um, it's changing so often and our team is so great that, um, you know, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm drawn towards it. Uh, you know, of course there I'll, I'll have bad days or I'll, you know, not want to, you know, last week was Thanksgiving week. So I'm plugged for most of the week and it was nice. Um, but most of yesterday, I was like, I can't wait to get in the office to actually sit at my desk and get some work done. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> I, I genuinely enjoy it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I got to let you go because I know you're busy right now. But you said this on your website that all that all our firm believers are living where you want to do good work. Do you hope to do good work by living here in Charleston? Um, hopefully by being here, I'll get to build a little bit larger of a spike ball community than there would have been otherwise. Um, I hope to meet, I've already started meeting plenty of other people, you know, that I wouldn't have met otherwise. And, um, you know, my, I've, I've got three kids as well. And the fact that they're living in a new area, yeah. uh, meeting new people, going to different schools, like I'm all about these new experiences and I don't want to get too stuck in the status quo. Yeah. Um, so new experiences, new people, new places, uh, you know, variety is the spice of life. If you want to use that line, I'm a firm believer in it. Um, and yeah, it's been working so far. So far. And you said this, be intentionally, intentionally inclusive. Where is there an opportunity to potentially create learning opportunities that will help your organization or your group move forward? Um, all over the place. So that um, value used to be be inclusive. Um, and we realized, you know, getting back to sort of the, the diversity element of things, you know, if you go to one of our tournaments, it's going to be probably 90, 95% white people. Even though we had this value of be inclusive. And we kind of thought like, oh, well, anybody can come to our tournaments. Anybody can register. You know, it's not like there's any... Uh, gates up or anything um, but we realized that wasn't good enough we have to be intentionally inclusive we have to go out of our way to try and invite others people that may not be coming to our events people that may not be purchasing our product people that may not be applying to our open jobs we have to be intentional about it so just putting up a link on spikeball.com that says we're hiring if we only relied on that then that means we're only going to uh, you know, primarily the people coming to our site are the people that look like me. Um, and while I definitely want to see as many applications as I can, I want to get them from everybody, not just people that look like me. So rather than only posting there, we're now posting on sites where, you know, they have a large uh, population of people of color, whether that be black, Asian, you know, whatever, women, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I believe most of our job postings now are going on most of the HBCU uh, websites um, and trying to do more and more around that sort of stuff. So we're learning. We've got a ton of work to do, but I like the fact that we add that, added that word intentional. Um, that, that, that feels like it puts a little more meat on the bone. You said this, own it. How do you own Spikeball five, ten years from now? Um. As long as we are still, you know, uh, as long as we're still listening and working with the community um, and we're trying to lead with the community, um, you know, I don't want to see us developing products or doing things that are just good for the company. 
but may not be, but may not be good for the community. If we do that, that's taking a short term approach and it isn't going to last very long. Um, so, you know, right now we are, you know, the number one round neck company in the world. Um, uh, really the only one focused on building the sport or building a brand. I have a feeling at some point others will, will join. Um, but, you know, oh, that's another one of our values that I absolutely love. It drives me crazy if somebody makes a mistake and then they point a finger, or try and pass the buck to somebody else. And, you know, whether that's me at work, my employees or, you know, my kids that, you know, made a mistake or whatever. It's like, guys, just own it. It's okay to make a mistake, but it's not to make a mistake and then pass blame on somebody else. So that, that's amazing. I love that. I love that. Well, Chris Ruder with Spikeball. Thank you so much for your time. And again. Welcome to Quintin's Close Ups. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed it. Likewise.